Uh, and just, you know, opening remarks, the, that, that, that the recession has really been so debilitating because uh, it really eroded the household balance sheet and it stripped assets away and families are left now huddling under this debt uh, overhang. Uh, but if you buy the premise of the magazine and this conversation that uh, jobs are not going to be enough and increasingly people are going to need to access very productive assets, then we need to know about policies that help people do just that. Uh, and I have a piece in the article that, that kind of highlights in, in short description a number of ideas uh, across the spectrum. And, and the first step, uh, as we've often talked about already this morning, uh, to promote the asset building process is savings, because that's the flexible resource that can be converted into a variety of forms. Um, and if we want to promote savings, we really should be looking at uh, the tax code in, in doing so in ways of changing it to promote savings. Uh, overconsumption, especially for those who would benefit it, benefit from it uh, the most. So we know the tax code is a mess. It's filled with this confusing array of tax preferred accounts uh, with all kinds of qualified uses and exemptions and penalties. Uh, and we need to simplify and consolidate that. But when we do so, let's not just create new tax sheltering opportunities for people that already have uh, assets, but let's create opportunities for, for introducing some fairness into the system so everybody can participate uh, in meaningful ways, not just those at the top. We've done some other analysis here at New America around the tax expenditures that, that promote um, asset building and wealth building that Phil, Phil referred to. There's a nice infographic that shows the kind of regressive nature of this existing policy. So one way to kind of invert that is to create an accessible in incentive uh, we call it the saver's bonus, uh, but it would reward families for making deposits into targeted savings accounts. You could, you could put a dollar in, get a dollar matched up to $500, $1,000 a year, um, and eligibility could be linked to some of the existing tax credits that are out there, like the earned income tax credit. Uh, you could have uh, eligibility for different savings products, like some of the restricted uh, retirement accounts, but also short-term products like savings bonds and uh, certificates of uh, deposit. So those are the incentives that we need to kind of enter into the mix. But we also need to create more savings opportunities for people, connecting people with savings plans. Um, and we can do so at different stages of the life course. Uh, as, as Phil described, uh, we, we, we've, we've transitioned, you know, who's responsible for retirement security, but many workers are not, uh, you know, connected to retirement savings plans. Everybody should have one. You know, it's an essential uh, kind of foundation for being able to augment whatever the social insurance uh, system is able to produce uh, years down the line. And enrollment should be automatic. Um, the administration actually has a proposal that does this partially called the auto IRA. Uh, workers wouldn't be required to elect to opt in. They could choose to opt out, but inertia is very powerful and would get us a lot of the way there. Uh, then when people want to contribute, uh, they can. Uh, we need to go further and make sure that everybody is included, not just people that are with employers that offer these opportunities, but part-time workers, contingent workers, people that enter and exit the workforce. They need to access an infrastructure that is there that can lead to a savings platform that will be there for the, for the long term. Um, another uh, uh, approach is to not wait until people are in the workforce, but to start early, start early in life. We could start at, at, at birth was a bipartisan idea we've been uh, pushing for a number of years in, in this bill called the Aspire Act, which had uh, previously bipartisan uh, support. Um, you could do it as soon as a kid gets issued a social security number. Uh, you could also do it when they enter public schools, uh, such as the city of San Francisco has their kindergarten to college fund, which they're just getting off the ground with kids entering in these early primary grades. Uh, and then the Department of Ed has just announced a large-scale demonstration where they're going to test this with high school students. And this is really linked to a lot of the experience and practice that, that Dana was uh, describing in her uh, talk and in her, her piece. Uh, this is going to be connected to their Gear Up program, which is a college readiness um, program focused on lower-income kids. But, but people that are in, those kids that are in schools, everybody in a grade will be able to will get access to this savings account with financial education. And uh, the idea is, is based on research that shows these accounts help people get, you know, prepare, get ready for college, 
uh, access and actually complete uh, degrees. Uh, so we've got some data that it's based on, but I think there's a lot more that we're going to learn from this uh, demonstration. And, and of course, as many of you might know, currently we have a system of college savings, these 529 college savings plans. They actually have a lot of nice features in terms of how they you know, deal with the economies of scale and um, um, nice set of uh, investment options that are, that are not too uh, complex. Uh, the problem is right now they're benefiting middle and upper income families. Everybody should be able to benefit from this type of uh, infrastructure and not just those um, at the top. And then also another concept that was talked about was you know, cleaning up the financial services marketplace. Um, where we've had a lot of actors uh, in there who are, are not offering good products. And we need to ensure that people get access to high quality and low cost financial products. And, and we need to kind of shut down these uh, modern day uh, loan sharks that in, through the course of human history, it sounds like, all the way back to the classics, has been a broad concern. And there's been a broad consensus that somehow we let uh, break down. Uh, and, and America at this point is fairly unique among developed countries in the number of families that don't have access to like basic bank accounts, transaction accounts, that we, have, we still have 10 percent, estimate 10 percent of families don't have a basic bank account. Other countries do this by offering these accounts at, at post offices, you know, low cost, you know, basic services. We, we don't. And um, we've, we've allowed families to then be kind of preyed upon by these nefarious actors, these you know, payday lenders, expensive check cashers, uh, the fringe financial sector, um, where you know the business model is the debt trap, um, and it's very uh, debilitating. So, this new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has to be empowered uh, to do its job and to uh, to kind of shut down some of these practices and create high standards for these uh, products and services. And banking, this basic banking, should be more like a public utility, where uh, you know you know, creating um, just opportunities for people to, to do the, the very basics uh, of, of moving money around. FDIC insurance, not a lot of hidden fees. Uh, and finally, just a few more words on, on home ownership, uh, which for many families is a primary wealth building strategy. Uh, it offers, offers the opportunity to pay down the mortgage, you build up equity, uh, it creates opportunities uh, for appreciation, for leveraging, uh, also for accessing local uh, amenities, neighborhood amenities. It's, it's clearly not for everybody at, at all times. It does come with risks, as we've seen with the bursting of the, the housing bubble. Uh, but we also know from experience that many of these risks can be mitigated with more effective oversight and, and, and regulation. Um, and this is where there's some data that's out there that's uh, detailed in uh, uh, the magazine where uh, if people got good products, appropriate products that, that match their circumstance uh, with the support of a network of, of, of other intermediaries and nonprofit groups, they could uh, make home ownership work for them. People that have come out of these programs have very much lower rates of, of default and foreclosure than the general population. They've maintained their housing equity, and it really is a, um, still a viable path uh, for them. Um, and so uh, as we kind of enter into a number of policy conversations, the, the one around what's the housing finance system going to look like uh, in the future as we kind of continue to figure out what happens next after we wind down Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, we have to make sure that these opportunities are uh, still available for, for moderate income families, families with lower incomes initially, initially fewer resources, but to help them get on uh, an upward asset building and wealth building path will be very important um, in, in the coming uh, months. Uh, so for, for more details on, on these ideas and, and many others, there, there's information in the magazine, there's evidence, there's stories uh, to tell on how to help uh, more Americans save uh, and build assets and build wealth. And I invite you all to uh, read the magazine.